Hello everyone, thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Salma Avdij with the American Marketing Association and I will be your moderator for our webcast today which is in partnership with ReadyTalk and is titled Killer Content Creating Content That Actually Drives Engagement and Results. Okay, so before we officially get started, I do want to cover some housekeeping items or reminders if this is not your first AMA webcast. So our session is being recorded today and will be made available later on this afternoon on AMA.org slash webcast. We also invite you all to continue this conversation on Twitter, and you can do so by referencing hashtag ReadyTalk when tweeting about this webcast. And of course, if you have any technical or content-related questions, please feel free to ask them at any point. You can use our chat area that's located on the left-hand side. All right, so with that, I'm pleased to uh, welcome and introduce our speakers. So we have Sarah Pilling with us, and she's the VP of Digital Marketing and Marketing Communications at PGI. And I do want to share a little bit about Sarah. So during the last 13 years, she has held a variety of roles at PGI, uh, and she has stayed consistently plugged into its public relations and corporate communication strategy. She's also a graduate of the University of Georgia's Grady College of Journalism. And we also have Dana Harder with us, and, who, and she is the VP of Strategy at Content for Demand. And a little bit about uh, Dana as well. So as in her current role, she helps B2B marketers turn their marketing organizations into demand gen rock stars, which is pretty hard and awesome <laughs> to do. So uh, what this means is that she helps content for demand clients build and re Find their content strategy as well as all corresponding content and demand gen efforts. All right, so with that, I will now turn it over to Dana to officially get us started. Thank you so much, Stella, and I'm super excited to be here today presenting with Sarah. Um, the, the idea today, creating buyer focused killer content, and um, that's actually going to turn results, is really where we want to focus. And I'm going to start today by just shedding some light into some content trends, and then how some content formats match up to those trends, and, and how you should be using that content to really drive the demand that we all need to have. So just a little bit on today's landscape. Our sister brand, Demand Gen Report, publishes a research report every year, and this is the Content Preferences Study. And there's some interesting stats in here that I wanted to share today because I think it, it just sets the stage for what we're going to talk about. So I don't think that this is new to any of us or that this is drastically different than what we've been seeing, but I think it's important to note that buyers are continuing to, to crave content. And what's interesting is 94% of, of B2B buyers are using more or the same amount of content to inform their purchase decisions. And if you add this up across the bottom, when we do 22 plus 40 plus 21, really, you know, we're at almost 80% of people are looking at at least five pieces of content when they're making that purchase decision. So I think it's just important to note that content continues to be important in what we're doing, and creating the right kind of content to help push them through that journey is, is becoming even more important than it was. I think it's also important to note that their preferences are changing. I do this, um, I go over these results every year, and so it's, it's interesting to see how they change year over year. And, it, you know, I think it's important to note this year that the trustworthiness of a source continues to inch to the top, and this year it's number one. So that's going to be really important, and we're going to talk a little bit about influencer content later on and user-generated content, and, and that's going to really play uh, – 
high, or place a high value in terms of the content that we're doing and what people are looking for. Also, you know, influencers, second in line there. And then interestingly enough, people are overwhelmed by the content available, which is going to make a case just for why we really want to make sure that the content we're creating is driving home to our buyers. And just some thoughts about why, what content um, people want to consume. So 88% of buyers want content that focuses on business value, not product specifics. This is not new, yet this is still something that we all struggle with at mar as marketers. We're still creating a lot of product-focused content. We're having a hard time giving them the thought leadership that they want. So just keeping that on, on point when we look at these different formats and what kind of content really is going to convert. And then this is interesting this year. Last year when I did this, it was really about highly visual content short format. This year, it was a renowning stat of 75% want more data and research to support content. So, you know, research reports, infographics, things that give them data points to help them make the case for their purchase decisions. So what does that all mean? It's, it's all great when we look at content. I think the key, and, and I know Sarah's going to drive this home more when she talks a lot about the foundational the strategy work that goes into your content, but understanding that we need to know who our buyers are. If we don't know who our buyers are, we're all creating content in a vacuum, and it, it's really a waste of all of our time. So when you take a look at the content trends I'm going to talk about today that are really those really cool formats and things that we're seeing, keep in mind that the most important piece Piece of all of this is not necessarily what format type you're using, but knowing who your buyer is and choosing a format that's going to speak to them. So the first trend I'm going to talk about is interactive and digital content. I think we're all aware that interactive digital content is the hot trend right now. Everybody wants it, but what is it? Why are we doing it? What's the difference? And I, I just had a conversation with someone the other day where we talked about interactive implies that there's going to be an action somebody takes in a piece of content. And that can be as simple as putting links in a PDF. So I think sometimes we get hung up that interactive has to be this big web-based, very, you know, multidimensional piece of content. And, and that definitely is a lot of what interactive content is, but we can start at a really easy level by, you know, doing a PDF and making sure all of our PDFs and static content have some interactive links in them. And I know it's not as seamless when it's in a PDF, but at least we're giving them other options and ways to connect with us and ways to continue their search or reading for content by adding links. So think of interactive as it's got to have some action that somebody's going to take. And that could be as simple as it's clicking a call to action button. It can be as simple as taking them to your web page or to another piece of content, all the way up to embedded quizzes, to um, choose your own journey type of content. So I'm not going to dive into a lot of these samples today, but what I'm going to do is talk at a high level about the different types of interactive content. And if anybody wants to see some interactive content after the webinar, they can reach out to me and I definitely can send some samples. So with the evolution of interactive content, there is tons of different ways that interactive is presenting itself. We're seeing a really one of the popular ways that we're seeing that is through interactive infographics. How can we take those really static infographics we've been doing and make them more interactive? Um, we're seeing a lot of side-by-side -side where it's split book experience and, you know, a really traditional up and down. But there's ways that these interactive pieces come to life. Those circles there actually rotate, they come in, they build, you can click in and out of them. So now we're allowing somebody to continue to build on their interactive experience. And these can be done through platforms. There's a number of interactive platforms out there, like Saros, Uberflip, Ion Interactive, Snap, um, Snap App. So there's a lot of those that can actually be used. But a lot of this can be done in an HTML5 custom-coded experience. iPapers and Digibook are the evolution of interactive in terms of what maybe our white papers were when they're static or eBooks. So think of a web page. And how do I turn a web page into a piece of content? And the great thing about these varieties and types of content is that they are 
they are completely mobile friendly. Everybody's used to looking at the content like that because they read like a website. Really cool things that we're seeing with listicles, think the BuzzFeed for B2B, so really short visual content that's online. They could be a web page, there could be lots of interactivity to them, there could be really simple, but it's really a list or a checklist or top five ways to do X or top 10 reasons to you know, implement now, things along those lines. And then reimagining the ebook in a flipbook format, we do these things called G-books, which are maybe when an ebook and an infographic had a baby. They're marrying two very visual but still um, stat-based, which when we saw that, that um, stat above, we know that stats and research are something that people are looking to have. And then case study portfolios, we've done some really cool things in Saros, uh, which is an interactive platform in terms of just rounding up our case studies. This is a great way to repurpose content that we already have on hand. And how can we take and, and shorten, make more visual our case studies, and then they can link out to the full case study. But it basically breathes fresh life into our content. And then great ideas, calculators, assessments, really well received. These tend to do really well in social, very top of the funnel promotional items, but looking for ways to engage our audience at a really deep level with our content. So the next trend I want to talk about is blogging. And we're seeing a resurgence of blogs. Not that it ever went away, but we're seeing blogs transform and evolve. And really become the foundation to a content marketing strategy. This came from that same research study that I mentioned before. And basically, the sad thing that I share the following content types with my colleagues, blogs was the number one shared piece of content. There's actually another step that goes with that, that blogs is the number two most read piece of content. And this was not even on this research reports radar last year. Last year, these didn't look even close to this. So blogs are definitely hot right now. I think what's interesting is how the blog is evolving and that it's really turning into this long form blog. So think an article. I mean, 1,000 to 1,500 words, we do short ebooks with that size and length of content. So the 85% of your posts these days are saying for optimal conversion should be 1,000 to 1,500 words and at least 15% of them should be 2,500 words. That's huge. These things are articles. The ones that we do for our clients are involving interviews with SMEs, and, and they are definitely meant to, you know, still meant to be skimmable, easy to get through, but they have some meat to them. They're informative. There's a lot somebody is taking away from these blogs today. I think the other thing just to note is the importance of frequency here. Companies that publish 16 plus blog posts per month got almost three and a half times more traffic than companies that were between zero and four. I know that seems overwhelming. That's a lot of blogs a week. And so as you're thinking about how you're ramping up for blogs, just want to give you some blog ideas. You know, as we saw, those word counts could, could be, you know, lower, smaller, all over. So what we say is, Mix it up a little. One way is once a week do a weekly highlights post. We do something called Fast and Easy Friday. It's a roundup with just really easy, quick hit articles that we, um, that we find. This blog literally comes together in 30 minutes for us. In and out, we've got lots of links. It's quick and easy. And then we supplement with that with our longer, more in-depth blogs. So that's one blog a week out of our three that we're trying to get to. Look for conference recaps. A conference can provide you with blogs to last for months taking your presentations, especially if you have your own conference or user conference, each one of those presentations could essentially be a blog. And those can be done ahead of time. They can be done, um, you know, with an editorial calendar, but the content is all there for you. And if you're able to see the recording, you can take some notes and add some quotes and things to them to make them even more meaningful. Derivative content, use your content. An ebook could fuel seven, six, you know, seven, eight blogs. So using your content that you have to drive some of those blogs, that can be turned really quickly and easily. If you did one blog a week that was a piece of derivative content from an asset, your quick recap, and then maybe something where you've interviewed a thought leadership person or an SME within your company or took a really, um, you know, important topic in your space at this time. 
So just some blog inspiration for you using seasonality, news jacking, Google Alerts, tools like BuzzSumo and Tracker, all great ways to help you fuel your blog calendar. So the other trend that I want to ch uh, chat about today is auditory and visual storytelling. And, and I don't I think everybody's aware. I mean, video is definitely hot right now. Um, you know, 95% of technology decision makers watch technology-related videos. We know that 87 prefer audio and visual content accessible on demand. And 75% of business executives watch work-related business um, videos on business websites at least once a week. So these stats are really compelling for video. And I think we're going to talk about podcasts in a minute. I understand these take a lot of time to produce. They're often expensive. So understanding of how we use auditory storytelling, whether it's video or podcasts, you know, doing your editorial calendar to make sure that maybe we really cover the really important um, aspects of what we want to tell through video and then our short, quick hit things that maybe don't necessarily need um, the visual aspect of it for a podcast or more of an auditory experience. So keep those in mind. Videos can present themselves in lots of ways. We know that motion graphic and animated videos are, are fantastic. They probably take the longest and are probably the most expensive to produce. Um, interview style, we're not seeing as much of these these days. We're, you know, people are going to mixed media and motion graphics, so throwing some of these in the mix is a great way to mix things up. And also realizing that these don't have to be super polished. Uh, Moz does a great, I don't know if you guys watch, but they do a video blog every Friday. I forget what it's called. But he's literally whiteboarding on a camera. And so it's, it's really low budget, really easy, great video to watch every week. And so thinking about ways that video doesn't always have to be this super polished, we've got it, you know, look high produced kind of, kind of asset these days. And then mixed media tends to be the really easy. I get some B-roll, I've got a voiceover, and I can tell a story pretty quickly. And these also can come together pretty quickly with stock video and stock uh, B-roll these days. But I want to talk about some really creative things that, um, that we've seen being done on um, on video. One of them is just thinking outside the box for video. Um, this site that we found does videos, they literally are answering frequently asked questions via video. How creative is that? So all of those questions, rather than have a list of the questions, every somebody from their organization are answering one of the questions for them. So a really great way to just tell the story, right, and, and get it out there with a visual component. The other thing that we're seeing is videos on landing pages drive significantly better conversion. So I still have a date to get the ebook or to get whatever it is that we're offering in terms of the asset, but I'm going to give you a quick 30-second video that gives you a preview of what you might get with that. And so we're finding that using that quick recap gives a better conversion to get them to go in and not abandon the landing page. And they're more likely to fill out that form and so you can capture that information you're going after. All right, so podcasts. I think everybody these days is experimenting with podcasts, at least in their personal lives. They're watching it, they have an interest, maybe they've got a series they like or they've listened to it, whether they're into wellness or fitness or whatever it may be. So remember that our B2B counterparts are B2C consumers in their after work lives. And so this podcast idea is starting to trickle down into our business, into our business lives. There's lots of different ways we can approach podcasts in the business world. One would just be a live interview where I've got a, a host or a moderator and they're asking questions of an influencer or, you know, a, a thought leader within your company. There's a, a look back type of um, of podcasts. So this is the serialize, right? The, the one that we all kind of like to kind of started things and got everybody started buzz around podcasts where I've got somebody telling a story and within that story I'm inserting pieces of interviews that I've had with somebody else or maybe a, a, a video or a demo or um, maybe a session at a conference. So it's, it's got a more, it's got a storyline where we'll see inserts of different stories or interviews, things, and going into it. You can just have somebody talk about a pain point. 
to be a really simple thought leader in your organization or an influencer that's talking about a hot topic of today. And they're just talking about that pain point and solutions and things they've seen work. These are great for clients to do for you or customers. I think we get caught up sometimes that case studies are all about um, the client talking about, you know, the, the, the implementation and then the savings or the ROI or, you know, how successful it went. But what if you just gave your customer a chance to talk about a pain point they'd experienced and how they solved it and make them a thought leader with the understanding that they're a client of yours? So they don't, we don't always need to say that, yeah, they did this um, and they got all these results. Sometimes we can just let them say that, let people look to them and position them as a thought leader. And then there could be a review. We could do reviews of products or something that's working really well. And so, again, really simple way to record. So the other thing is just to think about, you know, we can put podcasts on SoundCloud, iTunes, and you can make a series. And we'll talk about that in a second. But the other thing to do is just think about ways that we can embed podcast into content. So we talked about interactive content earlier. We've got a lot of clients who will do an interactive infographic and then take sound bites or clips from a podcast and insert them into the content. So while podcast series are great top of the funnel content, think about ways that you can also then take those clips and quotes and pieces of them and embed them into your interactive or even your static content or PDF. So a few podcast rules to live by. Make it serialized or um, episodic and be consistent with publishing. What we know is people are into podcasts, look for a series. So if you want to pilot one, do maybe five, six episodes, call it, give it a title, a series, and then you can stop and take a break and analyze the results. So the nice thing is, is I don't have to keep it continuous, maybe like social, but I do have to make a commitment to a promise of a certain amount and make sure that's communicated with my audience. They want this, this serial or this, um, this, you know, series type of format. They also look for them to be published at the same time. If you say it's going to come out the third Thursday at 5 o'clock Eastern every month, make sure that you're doing that. It, as soon as you miss, you're going to lose your credibility there. Shorter is better. Typically, um, we like to stay around 30 minutes, we find, in the B2B world. So we've seen them as long as two hours, but I, I find 30 minutes is the sweet spot. Find opportunities to repurpose, and influencers are great to add as guests for your podcast. So I'm going to take the last few minutes here before I toss this over to Sarah just to talk about influencer marketing. There's definitely a lot of buzz around this right now. And we know that influencer marketing can drive almost 11 times higher ROI than traditional forms of digital marketing. One of um, our clients that we help support with their blog has recently added an influencer component to their blog. And those blogs are seeing a three times the traffic than their, um, than their traditional blogs. And, and they're seeing pretty good results over on their blogs because they've really targeted their strategy. So just think about ways that we can, we can get influencers in there. Influencers can be used to improve brand advocacy, expand brand awareness, reach new target audiences, and you know, just looking at improving sales conversion and, and managing the reputation. So the other great thing about influencers is they can help fuel your content for you. Let them help write some stuff for your blogs or help write some social or participate in an article where they're answering some questions. It's a great way to AE some of the burden of the content creation and give you that third-party third credibility that people are looking for. We like to break levels of influencer content into two buckets. One where it's just individual asset creation where I'm engaging them for maybe a one-time piece of content all the way up to maybe a long-term engagement or more formal influencer engagement. And just to, to give you an example, this is a piece that um, LinkedIn did, and they are fantastic. They put an influencer component into all of their eBooks. And they're great at thinking about influencers as, yes, it might be an analyst. It might just be somebody really important in the space that has a really huge social following, 
but it might also be my salespeople who are using my product and have really good experiences, and we're going to ask them about how they use the tool, and it might be a customer. So thinking that influencers are not always those big analyst firms that you know, cost a lot of money, but influencers can be customers. They can be internal people. They can be partners or our channel partners. So it, it can really expand and, and open our, our eyes as to what can be involved here. So just to wrap things up today, and I know I went through a lot really quickly. So again, if anyone has any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. But just thinking about how are we aligning our content to our marketing strategy with all of these trends that are out there. As I mentioned earlier, know your buyers, know your pain points. That's really how you should be helping to decide which content we should do. Audit your existing content and align those to the buyers. All of us have tons of content. So how can we use our existing content to help fuel the blog, to help create? Can I just make it interactive? Can I make derivative content? Um, how, do, how do I use what I have? And then, you know, we're big proponents of making sure that there's some message maps in there that help drive that content creation. You know, do we, what's our strategy? What are those key messages that our, our personas have to hear? And let's help drive through that. I, uh, one of my clients always uses the term avoid random acts of content, and I think we're all guilty of that to some, um, you know, regard. So, yes, the trends are cool. We get caught up in interactive or, or podcast, something like that, but how does it fit into a real strategy, and is this what my personas really need to hear and see in order to convert? So with that, I am going to toss it over to Sarah. Thanks, Dana. Hi, everybody. Um, a little bit about uh, me and who uh, I work for. My name is Sarah Pilling. I work for a company called PGI. Chances are if you've been on a conference call in the last 25 years, you've used our technology. We are a B2B collaboration company supporting 45,000 enterprise customers. Um, and we're the parent company to ReadyTalk and TalkPoint. We're on a ReadyTalk product right now. Um, and just recently relaunched our flagship Global Meat platform um, earlier in 2018. So I'm excited to talk to everyone about content. It's a topic that's near and dear to my heart. I'm pretty passionate and pretty opinionated about it. And I've been working with our content team for the better part of the last five years. And I think one thing that I have learned is that content is a marathon. It's not a sprint. Um, the best content strategies that generate the best results are a long-term effort and prove out a great value over time. Content campaigns and content one-offs are important, and they're certainly a part of day-to-day -day business, but it's the longer-term approach that generates a greater return. One of the things that we do at PGI when we're talking about um, refreshing or relaunching you know, or reconfiguring our content strategy is we start with the fundamentals. And I went to journalism school and I learned how to write an article. Um, we were instructed to write articles like reporters write articles, which is to answer the basic questions, who, what, when, where, why, and how. If I applied these same fundamentals to a content strategy, you have to ask yourself some basic questions. And Dana did a great job and talked through a lot of these topics as well. Um, you've got to start with who is your audience. Who are your buyers? Who are your users? Who are you writing for? What's your point of view? What are you trying to get across? Is it a corporate message? Is it a product message? Um, are you really trying to impress um, information about your brand? What's your point of view? Um, when is really critical for a content strategy because understanding what that publish cadence looks like can be a really critical factor to your success. Um, and then there's where. Where will you be publishing? Um, are we talking about publishing on your blog, which is an owned channel? Are you talking about um, publishing in an earned channel via public relations efforts or influencer marketing? Or is this a paid sponsorship, a media sponsorship, an advertising opportunity? So understanding where you're publishing um, is critical. And then of course there's the why and the how. Why should someone read your content? Sometimes having that creative spark, having that something interesting to say can really drive a buyer or a user down a path. So understanding that creative spark can be really important. 
Um, and then the last piece, and, and we'll talk about this in a minute, is how are you going to not only organize your content, right, and, and how to execute on your strategy, but also how are you going to measure its success? I think the fundamentals are really important because you need a strategy. You need a content strategy. Strategy is not a bad word. Um, after you ask yourself these fundamental exploratory questions, then it's time to put pen to paper and really create that content strategy. Now one of the things I've done at PGI over the years is map our content strategy to our corporate objectives. Right? Our corporate objectives are our touchstone. And one of the reasons that, that, that we approach it this way is that early on it was the easiest and, and most streamlined way to convince our executives to invest in content. So if we were amplifying corporate objectives, then um, standing up a content team and content resources was a much simpler ask for investment of our executive team. Um, over time, one of the things that we've learned is that a strategy is also a living document, and it has to be recalibrated. It has to evolve just as your corporate objectives evolve. One of the great things that we've done over the years at PGI is also learn how to map customer-facing assets and content to the sales buying cycle. This helps the sales team understand the value that content brings. I think it's fair to say that as marketers, one of our most important jobs is to partner with sales, to drive leads, and to drive revenue. So if we can map content to the buying cycle, um, to illustrate for our sales team when to use specific assets, um, there's great value in that. The sales team, once they understand the value of content marketing, there's a lot of goodness that comes with that. In fact, one of the great victories um, over the years was I had a sales leader um, in Europe reach out and request that the content team deliver an ebook as a presentation to an interested customer. So this customer had found an ebook on trends, was really interested in the unique point of view, and was really looking to us as thought leaders and looking to us to sort of present that information. So that was sort of a unique point in time, and that was when we really saw the sales team understand the value and great and thoughtful content. Now, I cannot underestimate – if I can get my slides to click here – I cannot underestimate some of the values that I've learned over the years on the front lines of content. And one of them is to blog early and often. Dana touched on this, and I will just reiterate this. Um, frequent blogs have wonderful and rich organic SEO value. One of the things that has been successful over the years, but then also was something that we've struggled with over time, is to keep that blog content and that blog pipeline running. It's an important investment, and it's a long-term investment. Successful content needs people and vendors. It needs people to understand the company spirit, the mission, the product set, the corporate nuances, and it needs people to bring content to life. We have seen that content is most successful when it drives towards thought leadership and links closely with a PR plan. And I think it goes without saying that content is distributed and really comes to life via your social handles. So I would add that it is successful when it's linked with PR, but also when it's distributed and brought to life via corporate social handles. And one other lesson from the front line is that by working with execs and linking the business value and corporate objectives to your content strategy is a great way to prime content for success. Now, how do you know when your content strategy is a success? Well, I mean, I would – I think this is a um, – a saying that people have seen over the years, but if you can manage it, you can measure it, right? You've got to set up the appropriate measurement on the content side to ensure that you can claim victory. There's a couple of basic metrics that we look at 
One of them is a velocity metric. Um, and one of them is a revenue me measurement. Now that revenue measurement, that's the, that's, that's the, the ultimate goal. Velocity metrics are important because they can help provide some general health indicators, but that revenue measurement, is the, that is the gold nugget that you're looking for. Um, we think about at PGI content, Dana went through all of the different varieties and trends around content production. We think of it simply in two forms. We think of it as ungated content and gated content. Ungated content would be you know, web visits, articles, blog posts, things that you can come to our site and consume. Gated content or premium content are those things where we're requiring a registration. We want an email address. We want a form fill. And that lets us put you into our nurture streams and keep you warm. Now, gated content has very clear metrics around visits and conversions to landing pages. But over time, we see that gated content pays off over pipeline creation and revenue performance. Um, I've got up here on the screen just some snapshots from old content. Um, gosh, this is from some content reporting that we did when we were tracking visitors, form fills, and conversion rates. And one of the reasons that we did this, and these are sort of health velocity metrics, is to understand from a premium content perspective is which assets were the most useful. And if I look through here, buyer's guides, checklists, and then the, the wonderful white paper are those that tended to convert. We also would see when we would follow eBooks through the funnel is that they tended to be top of the funnel engagement, and it was our more middle of the funnel engagement where we tended to spend a lot of time and effort. eBooks top of the funnel, and then buyer's guides, checklists, and white papers more middle of the funnel. Um, so if I look at this revenue slide, this is actually from last year. This is some revenue reporting that we put together where we can get very granular around assets that have generated close one revenue. One of the ways that we do this is an integration with a software platform called Visible. So Visible measures multi-touch attribution and also takes into account and integrates with Salesforce so that we can follow a lead through from first touch, second touch, multi-touch, all the way through to closed one attribution. This has been um, probably one of the most challenging but one of the most rewarding exercises. Our analytics team spent at least six months standing up this integration, working out the, the finer points with Salesforce integration, and really looking and, and following leads um, across, not only through the funnel, but also across our website and other uh, marketing touch points. If there's one piece of software, if you're serious about content marketing, and you're serious about following content all the way, measuring it all the way through to the revenue contribution, um, this is a, a huge challenge but a huge reward. And we've had great success with partnering with um, Visible and integrating it with our Salesforce. So I'm really wrapping up my comments. Um, and I figure if nothing else, I want to impart a few learnings from the mistakes that we've made over the years. One of them is that video is hard. Um, I think you know I was referenced earlier, and I would agree, video is complicated. Um, and if you find good video talent, video vendors, then they're worth their weight in gold. But video storytelling is a challenge. It's a ton of fun, and when it's done really well, it pays off. Um, I would also say you need people. A content strategy and a successful content program needs great people. It needs great vendors. You have to have a technology stack. You've got to have software that can help you measure um, and optimize. I think it's important to have a creative spark, and then of course to have a point of view. So that way your customers, your buyers, your users want to consume your content. Um, we've made a couple mistakes over the years, and we've learned a lot, but one of the things that's really rewarding is to see that our content strategy over time has generated great results. 
Um, and it continues to evolve. It has to be reinvented. It has to be refreshed. Um, and that's part of the fun of running a content strategy. Um, those are my comments. I think I'm going to turn it back to, gosh, to Selma from AMA. I think we had a couple questions come in. I'm happy to answer them. I know Dana's still on the line, so looking forward to some questions from the audience. Yes, Sarah, thank you so much uh, to you and Dana. Uh, we have some great questions, so I'll try to get through as many as we can. Uh, we have a question here uh, from Kayla who is wondering, how do you know when to use interactive content over static? I can take that question, Selma. Um, so I think that it's important to know our audience, <clears throat> excuse me, in terms of what we said earlier. But I, I think that more important with interactive is really doing some testing and some trial. I think, you know, it's still really new. So I see a lot of people kind of jumping in feet first and like, we're going to do everything interactive. I think that's great to try it. And, but, you know, be careful about where we, where we start and putting all our eggs in one basket kind of thing with content. So I recommend, you know, testing it out with your audience. If you believe you have an audience where interactive is going to be well received or you have a great piece of content idea that you think the story is just told better through interactive, that it's great to test it out, see how it does for you. Um, as Sarah said, measurement is so important. So measure it. See if it's doing better than some of your other pieces of content. We had a client in the financial space who they were really unsure how interactive would resonate with them. And interactive has become some of their highest performing content. Same um, with one in the healthcare space. But we tried it out first to make sure that it really was going to resonate with some of those audiences, especially ones where we have the perception that they still want white papers or, you know, they might be a little more old school um, in how they approach, um, how they get their information. So I think it's, it's really about deciding what best is the story that can be told and who your buyers are, what we think, or if you've done formal personas, what they're reading, and then try it out first and make sure that it's working for you. Great, Dana. Thanks so much for that response. Uh, we have another question from an audience member that wants to uh, get some tips on how to get their executive team to buy into a content strategy. Um, it's Sarah. I'll take that one. So, you know, one of the ways that we've been able to get execs excited about our content strategy is get them involved early and let the content illustrate their point of view, um, whether it is interviewing someone and ghostwriting on their behalf or using maybe media outreach to help sync up with a point of view. I think if you get them involved and help amplify their own strong opinions and thoughts, then you really can not only convince them to support it, but get them excited about you know, the feedback loop. Um, we had an exec a couple of years ago that would call and leave voicemails when he got excited about something that he read as an idea for a blog post. And that was a great moment in time because then it helps kind of feed the machine. Uh, but I'd say getting execs involved with their point of view is, is how you get them to buy off on the investment as well. Great. Uh, thanks so much, Sarah. Uh, I think this question is for you as well. We have an, another audience member that is wondering if you have any best practices on how to manage the editorial calendar process. Well, um, it's not sexy, but a good old-fashioned spreadsheet works for managing the EdCal process. <laughs> um, I, I, it really comes down to putting um, the words on a page. Um, one of the things that we've done periodically is get in a room for a monthly brainstorm and understanding also across the corporate landscape what's happening. Are there trade shows? Um, are there holidays? Do we want to write together? I mean, do we want to get together and write a you know, New Year's resolution for collaboration technology list? So, is there any inspiration point from the calendar, from the existing marketing, you know, event schedule? Um, that it, it has it can be as simple and as complex as that, but I think it's really about getting things on paper um, and then mapping to those dates and and trying to hold true to those dates. It's not easy. Like I think right now, um, based on my current 
um, editorial calendar. I think we're a day late on a blog post. So, you know, it's a constant grind, but it's an important discipline um, just to keep content flowing and keep the machine running. Very fantastic. Thanks so much for for those tips. Uh, we have had tons of um, audience members ask about uh, podcasts, um, and and most of their uh, you know questions are about you know where is the best place to use podcasts in your strategy. Yeah, um, I'll, I can go ahead and, and take that some of this, Dana. So I think that um, we're seeing podcasts perform really well in the top of the funnel. So um, especially if it's, a, if it's a podcast series that you've created, and we're seeing it work really well in promotional aspects in there. So use it as a way to drive them to a piece of content. For example, uh, let's say you have a, a great ebook or a great piece of research you're trying to promote, and you're doing an interview with an influencer, Q&A is a podcast, go ahead and plug that ebook at the end. You know, if it's a topic that's in there, make sure the topic aligns. But hey, as, as we're taking us out today, we've got a great new research um, asset that can be downloaded here. Check it out, and we'll see you next week in our next, you know, episode. So using it as a way to drive to content. We've also seen some really creative usage where we'll do an interview with somebody, and maybe we'll ask them six questions, and three of them are in the podcast, and three of them go on the blog. So thinking about ways to cross-pollinate at the top of the funnel between blog and podcast. So if you want to read more, please check out our blog. There's more information on you know, so-and-so there, and same thing back and forth from the blog to the podcast here more. So it allows you to really, um, you know, try and get both angles. Now, later in the funnel, it works great, but we're finding it more then as it's embedded in content, using quotes or conversations that you've had um, as part of podcasts as proof points almost within your content. And that's how podcasts can kind of extend down the funnel. All right, wonderful. Thank you, Dana. I think we have time for one uh, question, if we can have a quick response. Uh, but, but the question is, uh, how do you go about actually getting you know, influencers to agree to participate in, in your content? Um, sure, yeah, I can drive that really quickly. I, it's, a, it's a little bit of grassroots marketing and reaching out. We, once our, we identify our influencer, we're going on LinkedIn, and we're just being really grateful, really transparent about what we're trying to do and, and looking for a win-win for everybody, right? We have this opportunity. We'd love for you to participate in this blog uh, or, this, or this piece of content. We know that you're an influencer here. Would you be interested in working with us on a piece of content that you, know, you can promote, we can promote? It's a win-win for everybody around. And you would be surprised at how many people say yes to that. Um, even though in not ask for money in return. I mean, occasionally someone's going to want money or it might be a big name, but most of the people that we're targeting will look for them on, on BuzzSumo, and then we just go to LinkedIn and we start reaching out. And we've had a really high success rate. And some people say no and some say yes. But the idea being that, um, you know, let's be honest about what we're trying to do and see if we can come up with a really cool solution that gives both of us some, some great marketing and some great press. All right, that's great. Uh, well, unfortunately, we have run out of time for today. Uh, but, you know, Dana and, and, and Sarah, thank you so much for, for your time, for sharing this great information, for, for sharing your, your lessons and, and um, insights. Um, any questions that we didn't have a chance to address, uh, please note that, you know, we'll be providing your, your uh, comments and feedback and, and questions to the team, so there will be opportunity to continue this conversation offline. Uh, I do want to thank uh, Ready Talk and PGI for the, for their partnership, and as well as for providing us with our web conferencing platform for today's webcast. If you would like to learn more about Ready Talk and their services, you are welcome to visit readytalk.com/ama. And uh, of course, thank you so much to our audience for your participation, your time. Uh, as a reminder, this uh, webcast will be available later on this afternoon on ama.org slash webcast. So you can uh, review these great uh, points and, and uh, watch at your convenience. So thank you so much, uh, everyone, again, and I wish you a great rest of your day.